welcome to Capitol Hill. I'm Lyndall Curtis. While the carbon price scheme is up and running, there are still a few details to be nailed down about how the scheme will operate when the fixed price period is over. The legislation passed by the Parliament included a floor price when the scheme moves to a floating price, with the floor price at $15 a tonne. But regulations are still needed to make that happen, and there's some debate about whether the floor price should actually be changed. Joining me to discuss this and the other day's events are Liberal MP, MP Bruce Bilson and Labor MP Amanda Rishworth. Welcome to you both. Good afternoon. Uh, Bruce, if I could start with you. The opposition leader, Tony Abbott, says the carbon price has only been in for five days, but the government's already talking about how to fix it. But this, this regulation always needed to be discussed, didn't it? It's, the government's not considering making wholesale changes to the tax. Well, it's hard to know. That's something that Amanda might be able to shed some light on. But here we have this uh, carbon tax scheme that's five days old and already the government's talking about changing some fundamental premises that, uh, uh, that are embodied in it. It's in the name of certainty, they said, where there must be a, uh, a floor price. Uh, this is just chaos and confusion. And uh, the floor price seems to now be up for grabs at a time when the current carbon tax price is much higher than they're talking about having the floor price. So, but, the, but the floor price doesn't come into operation until 2015. Surely the government needs to have discussions about how the regulations are going to operate between, between now and when those regulations come into effect. Well, they've made much of the certainty that's supposed to arise out of the government's approach. As you know, the coalition feels the uh, whole carbon tax scheme is flawed, regardless of what the floor price is. Uh, it's, it's um, well, ignoring global trends in the uh, price attached to carbon emissions. It's acting as a reverse tariff. It's already uh, at $23 and, and will be going up and up under the government's model. And now they're saying, well, there's a need to revisit it uh, and how it works just a few years out when the modelling that the government's relied upon uh, looks like it's of little use and little value. And I'm not well, sure what kind of comfort and certainty you can get out of that. Um, Amanda, Rob Oakeshott has already said he wants the floor price scrapped. The Prime Minister says that the government's consulting on the floor price and, and uh, uh, there's, not, uh, there's, there's not certainty yet, is there, over what the floor price will be when it does come into effect? Well, look, what we've clearly said, and anyone following this, and I'm disappointed Bruce hasn't been following this, is that we did legislate for a floor price to come in in three years' time, and uh, we would be consulting with stakeholders and with a whole range of people to work out the regulations, the details around that. That's exactly what we're doing, and we're going through that process now. Now, of course, this is in three years' time. We have a fixed price in which business can build certainty in, and we're working through that. Uh, this is not a new thing for anyone. Of course, Lyndall, the only uncertainty would be the Liberal Party's policy. And we but do know that policy is to throw out the carbon price to do a more economically irresponsible scheme that gives certainty to no one. The, the floor price, though, Amanda, was legislated, wasn't it? It would be pretty difficult to move from that, wouldn't it? Well, look, we're working through the details through regulations about where, how it's set, how it's going to operate, and that has been clear for some time. We've been in ongoing discussions about that and will continue to do that. Uh, but uh, this is the scheme that we've, we brought to the parliament, that the parliament voted on, and this is the, the scheme that's up and running. So we will continue to go through that process. But to suggest that this is some sort of uh, unexpected uncertainty is not the case, especially for anyone that's been following this. This is clearly uh, the process we were going through. We, we might move on now. 162 asylum seekers who were rescued from their boat yesterday after sending a distress signal are being processed on Christmas Island. The government says the tactic of calling Australia Australian search and rescue authorities is not new. The opposition leader says under the coalition, the naval commanders would have had the option of turning that boat around. Uh, they would have the option uh, of taking those steps that are necessary uh, to get that boat turned around. And what used to happen under the Howard government was that uh, naval personnel would board, board boats, uh, they would ensure that they were seaworthy. Uh, they would rem remove fuel from the vessels so that the only option from that for those vessels was to return to Indonesia. Tony Abbott should once and for all listen to the expert advice. He should look at the history. 
turning the boats back is a highly dangerous plan which risks the lives of asylum seekers and Australia's Defence Force personnel. It is just wrong-headed and uh, plenty of experts have said so, apart from the fact that Indonesia have made it very clear, very clear, that they do not support and will not cooperate with such a plan. Amanda, if we could go first to, the, to the, what the Home Affairs Minister, Jason Clary, says, says is not a new tactic of those on asylum seeker boats calling Australian search and rescue authorities. The, the search and rescue authorities have no option, do they, but to respond to every call of distress? Well, look, uh, as uh, I think Jason's clearly stated, um, that they do have to respond, and, and sometimes it is a false uh, claim, and sometimes it is accurate. These boats are in distress. I think we, we it was re responsible for us to respond to any uh, any. I guess, distress signal out there. So I think uh, if lives are at risk, we do need to respond. Of course, uh, the, word, it, the comments Tony Abbott's made has just shown the hypocrisy of the Liberal Party. Last week, Joe Hockey was in the Parliament shedding a tear for uh, young people, ch children that could be sent to Malaysia. Of course, now what we're seeing, Tony Abbott today, whatever force is necessary, he will turn around the boats with children on, put their lives in danger, put the lives of Navy personnel in danger uh, and in fact send them to Indonesia. I mean, this shows that Tony Abbott is purely using this as a political football. One minute they're crying about children, the next minute at gunpoint they're turning boats around with uh, children Bruce, on them. So, Bruce, uh, Mr Abbott talks a lot about turning boats around. He mentioned today the experience in the Howard government, but wasn't the reality under John Howard that actually very few boats were turned around? That's right, and that's why the issue of the, uh, whether the boats are navigable, whether it's safe to turn them around, are important considerations. Uh, no one's suggesting you'd try and turn around a boat that is uh, clearly unseaworthy and in distress and requiring rescue. Sounds like rescue, you're backing away, when, Bruce, from but, Tony. Uh, Amanda, no, if we could just Thanks, have Bruce answer. <clears throat> Now, I've been very courteous listening to the pre-chewed lines from Amanda. I was hoping to provide a considered response, and what I'm pointing to is that each case needs to be evaluated. But where the boats are seaworthy, they're navigable, they are safe to turn around, uh, that should be done. Let's remember, these boats are Indonesian flagged vessels. They're Indonesian boats. They're captained by Indonesian captains. They have on board people who uh, happily uh, commuted through Indonesia to get on those boats, and in some cases the call of distress is still within sight uh, of Indo Indonesian territory and but, so but can you, where can the you... opportunity is there to turn them around that should be part of an armory of dealing with border protection concerns that includes temporary protection visa visas and offshore processing. But can you turn boats around even in the rare cases where it's done without the cooperation or, or the, the say-so of the Indonesian government? Well, we had cooperative, effective and proven arrangements under the Howard government. We are now dealing with the consequences of the Gillard-Rudd governments turning their back on what was proven to work just to earn some plaudits and some cheers from a few stakeholders in Australia that's created an enormous problem, an enormous problem. So what we need to do is return to the solutions, the package of measures that have worked before and see that they are put in place quickly and given the opportunity to work again yes. rather than consider this fiction that the government's putting forward where they have some theories about what might work, where they argued that those solutions were put in place until the, the High Court struck them out as being unlawful, you've got theory proven not to work versus if practical measures that have been proven to work. I know where I think the energy should go and that's on what's proven to work in the past and that's the Howard and that's government sort of measures. Um, Amanda, uh, we had, a, we had a, a, almost a week-long parliamentary debate last week about this. It hasn't really moved anywhere, has it? When, when will the time come when Labor and the Coalition can agree to legislate something you already fundamentally agree on, which is offshore processing? Well, look, of course, Bruce has uh, made it clear that they support offshore processing. And in fact, last week, the Liberal Party and the Greens voted against <coughs> offshore processing. That's what they voted against in the Parliament. We were, uh, we were looking at ensuring we could use this as a deterrent, and they voted against it. Of course, Bruce. we have compromised. Nauru was a big part of their solution. The Labor Party, as you would know, has not always favoured Nauru. But last week we said, yes, we'll go ahead and do it. If, as long as they gave you Malaysia. Chances. 
Well, yeah, that's Lindell, a I mean... compromise, Lindell. That's a compromise. We said one thing will work. They said another thing will work. We said let's do both. That is a compromise. And, of course, the Liberal Party had said no. Said Bruce, no to Bruce can, you see, can you see a time when this will be agreed? Well, I'd, I'd like to think that we could start with some clear facts. I mean, the coalition... Uh, compromised by not insisting on temporary protection visas, even though we know they work. Well, the Coalition didn't insist on having available the option of turning around boats where it's safe to do so. All we said to the government was we have responsibilities for those that are in our care to make sure our convention responsibilities are upheld, regardless of where people are processed under Australian arrangements. That was something that Prime Minister Gillard said she would insist upon prior to the last election. We're saying honouring our undertakings is something we agree with. The High Court said the government had walked away from that and their scheme was unlawful. I think there's some pretty sound basis to stick to what the Prime Minister said once mattered, what Labor once believed in, and then we can move forward from there. But to keep running these fictitious arguments that uh, the Labor MPs re, you know, regurgitate talking points about is not taking well, us anywhere. We, we, might, we need to we get might, past that and look at real solutions. We might view. move on just quickly to one person who is offshore at the moment, and that that's Clive Palmer, who's in Tahiti. He's still holding out the possibility of making a run for Parliament. Bruce, he's mentioned the seats of Kennedy and Fairfax. Uh, Tony Abbott's not commenting on, on the issue, saying it's yesterday's move. But, but Bruce, he's a successful businessman. He's long been a member of the conservative side of politics. Why not welcome him into a seat with open arms? Well, Clive Palmer's got every opportunity under our grassroots political party to offer himself as a candidate for pre-selection. And he spoke yesterday about how if he was uh, going to do that, he's inclined to uh, offer himself in electorates where he has some strong connection, connections relating to the creation of jobs, uh, the restoration of hope, reward and opportunity in communities where he's well known and respected. Now, uh, that sounds like a good starting point, but he does need to go through the Liberal National Party pre-selection process and uh, pit himself against other candidates who also have admirable qualities and then let the, uh, the, the grassroots members of the Liberal National Party decide who they feel they'd like to support and get behind uh, you, come the next federal election. Do you think he will run? I'm not sure. I, I was watching that interview from uh, Tahiti and he, he spoke quite eloquently about his thinking. He didn't commit to any particular course of action, but he did highlight that if he was going to run, he'd want to be uh, legitimate in a and have a genuine connection with the community within which he was offering himself. That's mm -hmm. a good starting point. Uh, local communities like to know their local MPs have local connections. So I think he's uh, reflecting that in his comments yesterday. But Amanda we're a broad church of much talent and uh, Clive's welcome to put his hand up to to, to offer himself as a candidate. Amanda, just quickly, because we're about to run out of time, would you rather see Clive Palmer run in a coalition-held seat than in a Labor seat? Well, look, Clive Palmer's clearly shopping around for a seat. Uh, he tried Lily and got slapped down by the opposition leader, and now he's looking for another opportunity. I think really what this shows is there's huge division between uh, Tony Abbott and Clive Palmer, and I certainly wouldn't want to be in a room with both of them while they're having an argument. And that's why we'll have to leave it. Amanda Rishworth and Bruce Wilson, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Lyndall. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you. And thank you for joining Capitol Hill. Please be with us at the same time tomorrow.